Um, so like I said, my name is Alicia Rogers with Purdue Extension. So we'll just get right into it. So artificial insemination, who can tell me what that is? <laughs> yep. Yep. So basically, and we're going to use the correct terms here. So introduction of sperm in the female reproductive tract by means of an instrument. So we're not using the actual male himself. Um, trying to cover this on both the sheep and goat side of it. If I start just saying bucks and does, stop me and say male, female. <laughs> I'm used to bucks and does. So, all right. So introduction. Basically, we're using mechanics to get that done. It's really the oldest technique in assisted reproduction, so that means helping that mating occur. And the use of artificial insemination, or AI, I finally got my office staff to start thinking artificial insemination instead of artificial intelligence, because I've been talking about it so much last month. Um, but basically, it's animal reproduction. It was originally introduced for sanitary reasons. Um, I say sanitary reasons because obviously when you have bucks and or males and females together, you're obviously getting a cross-contamination of different fluids, things like that. Um, if you happen to take your females to a different farm to get bred or bring the male to your farm to get bred, there may be some co type of contagion or not contagion, but some sort of disease or something that you don't want to cross. So by taking one of those elements out, you help to reduce or help increase your biosecurity of your facility. Um, <clears throat> and so as a result, farmers soon recognized that artificial insemination was the method of choice for rapid, or rapid introdu introduction of valuable genes. Um, so basically, instead of buying a whole animal, um, so for example, about two years ago, Newton Farms up in Lakeville, Indiana, they're huge in the boar goat industry. Um, they had basically inventory reduction sold out of probably 75 to 80 percent of their stock. Um, so I just watched online just to see kind of what those prices would bring. Um, so on the doe side, they went from everywhere from about 500 up to I think about $10,000 per animal. On the buck side, I think one of the cheaper ones went for about $1,200. The most expensive was $26,000. So when you're looking at a live animal for $26,000, if you can go and collect semen from him and get a straw of semen from him for $100, $150 instead, but you still have those great genetics because you have the semen, it makes a lot more, yeah, a lot more economic sense. It's unbelievable what some people will spend. <laughs> so some of the benefits or some of the pros of artificial insemination, obviously like we just mentioned, increased rate of genetic improvement. So you can get that semen for a cheaper price than you would the live animal. So you get an increase easier. Introduction of rare or expensive genetics. So the boar goats have actually only been in America since 1993. So we're looking at, well, now we're looking at 25 years of them being here. But that's still not a long period of time when you're looking at some of the dairy goats and things like that that were brought over with the pilgrims and such. So. But if you're looking at rare or expensive genetics, so like I mentioned, the $26,000 buck, or if you want to go back to some of the original boar genetics that were brought over here in the 90s, you could still do that if they have viable semen still available. So semen can last for several years, several decades even. So if you wanted to get back into some of those old genetics, you could. <clears throat> no cost for buck maintenance. Um, at one point on our farm, I don't remember if it was this year or if it was last breeding season, we had nine bucks on our property. We only have six acres. Um, so they, they play together well during about six, seven months of the year, but during breeding season, they don't play as well. Um, no. So obviously when they're during breeding season and rut, um, things like that, they can get a little costly on gates and things like that. So if you don't have to have that buck there or that male there, you get that reduced cost. And then predetermined kidding dates. You know that date when you injected that semen. There's no possible range of dates where she could have been bred. That's the date. So you can project out from there how many days 
when you should actually have basically babies on the ground. Cons could require facilities, so you need handling facilities, so a place, a stand. Um, if you're trying to AI in the late fall or winter when it's colder, you need someplace a little bit warmer. So do you have those locations? Requires expertise. Yeah, anybody can go on YouTube and watch a video and try to figure it out there. But when you're getting it done correctly and properly, you really should attend trainings when you're looking at transcervical AI, which we'll talk about in a little bit, or the laparoscopic, which is a surgical kind. You really should have a vet or somebody that's expertly trained to do that so you're not doing something wrong. Requires multiple handling of animals. So on the buck side of it, or the male side of it, obviously you've got to handle them to get the collection done. Um, the female side of it, if you're breeding out of season, you probably have to use um, some hormones of some sort. So you'll have to handle her to get those hormones done. Um, handle her a couple times to make sure she's in standing heat, ready to go. Handle her again when you're doing the insemination. So there's more kind of handling of the animals instead of just putting the male and female in a pen together. So next we're going to kind of walk through the various kind of reproductive tracts of both the male and female so you get an idea of where the sperm and the eggs come from in this whole scenario. So this is our example of our male reproductive tract here entirely. Um, I think this is actually a steer, but it's the same general idea on sheep and goats. So we're going to start basically at the base where the sperm are produced, and that's going to be in the testes or the testicle. Um, male gonad, site of sperm production, and it's the site of that testosterone production. So if your buck's not really, or your male's not acting bucky, um, it may be that he has kind of low testosterone level, so you may need to get that checked out. Next on our list is the epididymis. I just like saying that word, it's a fun one to say. Um, but that's here, surrounding the testicle itself. So basically you have the testicle, the epididymis, and then the scrotum, which surrounds that entirely. So the epididymis connects the testicle to what's called the vas deferens, which is this long tube here coming out of the testicles. It consists of three parts, which is the head, the body, and then the tail that connects to the vas deferens. So that basically, once the sperm is basically produced in the testicles, it then comes out through the epididymis and starts making its way through the rest of the reproductive tract. Um, so again, responsible for sperm cell storage, maturation, so it gives that sperm time to kind of mature a little bit before it continues on its journey, and increase in concentration. So while the sperm is being produced in the testes, the epididymis kind of stores it there and collects it until it's ready to be released. Next up is the scrotum. Like I said, it kind of contains the testicle and the epididymis. It's that protective covering. If you've ever been to Australia, they have kangaroo scrotum pouches all the time. I've seen kind of as a souvenir thing. Same idea on our males. Um, AIDS and temperature regulation. So if it gets too cold, it helps to keep them warm. If it gets warm, it helps to keep them cool. You get the idea. The vas deferens comes next. So this is the tube that comes out from the epididymis, and it connects the epididymis to the accessory sex glands. So those are all up here kind of more towards the backbone. A portion is removed um, during a vasectomy. So that's what happens when these males go through a vasectomy, that vas deferens is separated. Um, ideally, a couple inches are taken out just so there's not that chance of it regrowing. Um, but there are actually males in the AI industry that they use kind of as teaser, what they call teaser bucks. So they're males that have been, had a vasectomy, but they still know what to do on that business. So it's easier to tell when the female is in a standing heat. So if you're going to do AI, that would be, might be a good thing to invest in. All right, so next we have our accessory sex glands up here towards the top. So these are what secrete the buffers. Um, they provide energy sources 
to that semen, so they provide some of that protein content to it and contribute to the overall semen, val semen volume. So you have the sperm itself, and then you have all these seminal fluids that go into it, that combine together, that make what comes out. So accessory sex glands are made up of the ampulla, the prostate, the seminal vesicles, and the bubble urethral glands. That's another fun word to say. So next, we have coming back down the sigmoid flexure, and that is a muscle. Um, so it straightens out during the erection. So basically, you can see it's kind of curled, kind of like an S almost up here. When that animal gets an erection, it pushes the penis out. Then we have the retractor penis muscle, which is this green one right beside the sigmoid flexure. And again, that's another muscle, and that relaxes during the erection, allowing that penis to go out. So when the erection's done, that tightens back up and retracts the penis back in. And then lastly, we have the penis. Obviously, this is our copulatory organ, and this is the final track that that sperm, that semen, is going to go on to exit the male. So that's kind of our male reproductive anatomy. Um, so when we're looking at sperm characteristics on both sheep and goats, um, when they're being collected and evaluated, these are kind of some of the parameters that they want to look at with some of the averages for good working semen. Um, so volume, they're going to collect it and kind of divide it up. They want at least one milliliter of sperm, so we're, or seminal fluid. So we're looking at the sperm and all those fluids combined for a viable, basically, injection when you're going to AI an animal. Um, motile sperm, you're going to want about 80%, kind of 70 to 90% range. So that means stuff that's just moving around in there. Might not be moving the right way, but it's at least moving. Um, sperm concentration, so how much is in that one milliliter of fluid? You're going to want about 4 billion sperm per one milliliter. It's a lot. But it can range anywhere from 2 to 5 and still be fairly viable. <coughs> and then we have what's called morphologically normal. You have that about 80%. So this means these are sperm that are going to be viable. They have the right shape. They're traveling in the right motion. Um, so about 80% is what you'll want on that. If you have anything lower than that range, it may be a little harder to AI, um, and it will definitely be a lot harder to freeze that semen and then use it again later. So we're talking about motility of that sperm real quick. Obviously, motility is just plainly the movement of that sperm through the seminal plasma. Um, like I said, it doesn't have to move straight, it doesn't have to move, it can go around in circles even. But that's just what they're talking about is the motility. It's just moving. Total motility is a total sperm movement through the seminal plasma. So how does it move as a whole? And then progressive motility. So this is that, those sperm that are moving in a forward motion. So are they moving basically with an end goal in mind trying to get to that egg? Or are they just out there doing circles? Um, right now we have 12 bottle babies at home. Not all of them are by choice. But one was a triplet that was born. Um, she was actually the biggest of the triplets. Thought she was doing fine. The next morning we went out. She was pretty cold, so we brought her in. Got her warmed up, got her to eating. Um, later that night I got to looking at her. She doesn't have a left eye or a tail. <laughs> so that's probably why mama wasn't taking care of her. But she doesn't really have great progressive motility. Um, she kind of stands there and just walks in circles going round and round to the right because she can't see out of that left eye, so she's always trying to see what's going on. The other night I noticed that she did try to make a couple of straight beelines, kind of worked for it, kind of didn't. But you want to keep that sperm moving forward and not in a different direction than where you want it to go. So once that male is collected, they'll go through basically a semen analysis. So those samples will be analyzed, looked at under a microscope. It's very easy. You can do it yourself. Just get a basic compound microscope, a little slide, 
and you can see them moving in whatever direction. So you look at it for basically if you're going to use it right then and there or if you're going to freeze it. Based on the analysis, you'll see if it can freeze or not. So this is what I'm talking about, that forward, based that progressive motility. So how well does that sperm move forward? Is it functioning as it should? So these are different examples of sperm um, that obviously have different kind of abnormalities. So in A here, we see a little divot at the top. It's almost fully functional, but not quite. B, you see a little lump here, just where the tail begins. That could kind of cause some issues. Um, quite a few of these have different lumps going on on them. Um, I, you can see here where the tail is whipped around. That's not going to move in the best manner because that tail's not straight. It's like an, like an oar, not an oar, but a rudder on a boat. If your udder, rudder, rudder, keep thinking udders, if your rudder, whatever. If it's not straight, you're not going to go in a straight direction. There we go. Same with quite a few of these towards the end. And then here on P, you can see where there are two sperm kind of joined together. So it's kind of like a Siamese twin. They're not going to move too well together. So, All right, so if you have frozen semen that you're going to use for your artificial insemination, it's important that you take care of it. Um, obviously, you're going to be in a most likely a liquid nitrogen tank. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, about how cold it'll get. But it's important when that semen is thawing that you put it in some sort of thermos like these and keep it at a steady temperature of about 95 to 98 degrees until you're ready to use it. Um, obviously, once you thaw it, you want to get it used within probably about 15 minutes or a half hour. You don't want to free, unthaw it and then go to refreeze it because you're going to kill everything that's there. Kind of looks like it, but not. Um, so basically what these are, these are pictures of different thaw cups is basically what they call, that, call them. Um, so you basically just put water in these containers and they heat up. It'd be nice for a coffee pot because it would keep everything at a steady temperature. Um, actually it just holds water so it's not, not too big of a deal at that point. So, but yeah, so these just hold water and keep it at that steady temperature to keep that semen viable until you use it. So when we look at freezing semen, um, typically your best results, your most avid sperm, is going to be during the natural breeding season. So for most sheep and goat breeds, that's going to be kind of in our fall, kind of August to December time frame. You might be able to push it until about February. Um, we do have a few breeds. Um, I know some of the hair sheep and things like that can kind of breed out of season. But ideally, you want to collect that male while he's in season, while his sperm are the best. Um, obviously it's going to be variable from male to male and even collection season to collection season on what you're going to get, how viable it's going to be. So obviously like we said, season, during the season, you're going to have a stronger, probably stronger um, collection. Out of season, they're not really used to it. So you've got to get them into the mood to get that collection done. And then the individual animal, like I said, your different bucks are going to have different effects, going to collect a little bit differently. And then sometimes um, the companies that will collect that semen will use what's called extenders, so just to get a little bit more fluid in those semen straws. So it can be something like an egg yolk. It is natural. It can be used with that semen to kind of extend it or a non-animal protein that won't react to that semen. So, um, and that's going to be variable as well. So like we said, the post-thaw semen evaluation. We said the semen is very sensitive to temperature change, um, mainly decreasing. So once you get it warmed up, you want to keep it warmed up. Otherwise, once it starts getting cooled back off, some of that semen can start dying off. Um, be aware of your environment, so if you're thawing in a barn area, um, we just AI'd a doe here be two weeks ago this Saturday. Um, for February it was fairly warm, but it still wasn't, I think it was below freezing by the time we got it done. Um, so we had to make sure once we got that semen straw out of the thaw cup, put it in the gun, 
My husband kept it right against his body for that body heat to keep it warm until I found the exact spot we needed and we got her done. If you're doing it in a climate controlled building, obviously that's great. You have kind of that controlled climate. You don't have occasional breezes coming through. If you're working in an old bar and things like that, that can cause issues. And then if you are going to evaluate the semen after it's been thawed, just to make sure that it is actually viable, you'll need kind of a slide warmer because if you have glass slides, if you just pull them out of a closet somewhere or if they've been in your office in the barn and it's not really temperature regulated, putting that warm semen on that cold glass isn't going to work too well. You're going to get kind of false results. So this is an example of a semen report on this guy here. Um, so basically what they collected for semen volume, once they divided it out, it's about 70, about three quarters of a milliliter. That's well within the appropriate range. The motility is where we have an issue. So the result of the re report he only has about 45% actual motile sperm, so that are actually moving. Ideally, you want it between 70 and 90%. His concentration was good, about 3 billion, and his morphology was only about 80%. So when you're looking at 80% of that 45% that's motile, you're not looking at a lot of actual viable sperm. Um, so this buck would not be great for freezing, because already when you get started, you're looking at only about 36, 38% of that sperm actually being morphologically correct to AI or doe, or your AI or female. So, not good for freezing, because once it goes into that liquid nitrogen, it gets down to negative 320 degrees. That's cold. That's gonna shock some of them to start with. So that's gonna decrease your chance of having viable sperm once it's thawed. This one, however, have an average of a milliliter of, of semen, 90% motility, so great motility on this guy, got 5 billion sperm in this concentration, and 90% morphology. So he would be a great candidate for frozen sperm, um, just because of the great morphology, the great motility, the good concentration levels going to have a better, higher success rate when the thawing occurs. So like I said, this is an example of a semen tank, liquid nitrogen tank. Um, so we can see here, this is our liquid nitrogen down below. It gets down to negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit. When you look at the top six inches, so this is what would be called a shipper. So you'd put your tank, smaller tank in here and get it shipped. Um, but when you're looking at a liquid nitrogen tank or a semen tank, there's a little neck on it to get everything out. You very quickly raise the temperature in just the top six inches. So you go from negative 320 to negative 103 in just about three inches right there. And then up to whatever the air temperature is in the final three inches. Um, so if you're going, basically when semen is stored in straws in a tank like this, they're little small individual straws. They almost look like coffee stirrers. Um, so they're glass tubes. And then on the outside of those is identified which bucket was, when he was, or which male it was, when he was collected, and who did the collection. So that's all on the outside of that straw. A Little bit difficult to read occasionally if it's not done quite right, but all that identification is there. So that straw is then put inside um, it could be called the, the goblet. So it's a little plastic cup almost. You can hold about 10 to 15 straws in each of the little goblets. And then from there, the goblet is then connected to what they call <coughs> basically a cane. So you can usually put two goblets per cane. So it's just a little metal, um, almost a hook with some connectors in it. You just push the plastic goblets into it and you put it down in there. So you obviously have to keep track of which semen is in which goblet and what you're looking for. So there are usually identification tabs, tabs on the top of those canes so you're not pulling every single one out looking for something. Because the longer that you hold that semen up in this danger zone, the top six inches, the more chance you have of it starting to thaw. So when it's reintroduced to liquid nitrogen, you could have that sperm that's killed. So, 
All right, so correct semen handling and transferring. Obviously, like we've said, just ex um, express that you want to maintain semen quality. So you've paid for that semen. You want to make sure that you get out of it what you've paid. Um, so like I said, they have very small surface area. They're basically the same size as a coffee stirrer. So very small, so they warm up really quickly. Um, so when you're transferring your semen from the liquid nitrogen tank to your thaw cup, you want to do it fairly quickly. Um, then from the thaw cup to the actual gun, again, quickly and keep it warm. So any questions on the male side of things? All right, so we'll look at female reproduction real quick. So we're going to start from the outside and work our way in on the females. So we're going to start right here at the outside. This is what's called the vulva. So it's the external genitalia. That's where everything goes in and provides an opening to the vagina. So next up is our vagina. It's between the vulva, which is the outside, and the cervix, which is located more internally. <coughs> and so this is where the semen is deposited when you're looking at natural mating with the live buck. So we're looking at right here. So that semen has to make it all the way from here all the way back to here. So this is where AI helps. You can get the sperm in a lot farther. Next area is the cervix. It's kind of this pink bumpy area here behind the vagina. Um, consists of dense connective tissue and several folds. Um, when you do artificial insemination, usually, at least on goats, when you get to the cervix, there's, you have to go through about three rings. So it's kind of <coughs> about three pops that you have to get through to get further in. So it's really dense and kind of hard to push through at times. And then behind the cervix is what they call the uterus, and that's made up of the uterine body and the uterine horns. So there's a horn coming off of each side of the body. So it kind of looks like a ram almost. So you have the head and the horns coming off of it. And then on the opposite end of the uterus is what's called the oviduct. So there are little channels that connect each uterine horn to an ovary. So this is the location where the sperm actually meets the egg and where fertilization actually occurs. So during natural mating, the sperm has to make it from the vagina through that cervix, that dense tissue, through the uterus, and then finally to the oviduct. That's a pretty good trek for those guys. So that's why you want to have good progressive modal sperm that are going straight. <coughs> and then lastly, we have the ovary. This is here on the end of our oviduct. And this is the primary sex organ. This is where the eggs are produced and where the hormones, um, progesterone and estrogen, are produced. So this is what makes the female tick. So down here in the lower left, we see a picture of an actual ovary. And all these little bumps that you see on it, different colors, there's yellow, there's blue, there's kind of a red, those are different follicles. So those are different, basically, eggs that are getting ready to be expelled and be fertilized. <clears throat> so like we said, the ovary produces estrogen and progesterone, which helps in the heat cycle, and so it communicates with the brain. That's what those hormones do. So as a result of that communication, the brain then produces a couple of hormones called follicle-stimulating hormone. So basically it stimulates those follicles to be produced, and then luteinizing hormone, which basically if the female doesn't get bred, then it kind of tells that female to go back into another heat cycle. If she does have successful fertilization, then the luteinizing hormone doesn't get produced. So this is an example of a female's, well, this particular one is a goat, but an estrus cycle, so that heat cycle on that female. So we'll start kind of at day zero, kind of repeats at day 20. So at day zero, this is what they call estrus. Um, Day one to four is metestrus. So you can see those progesterone levels starting to increase. You can see here at day zero that basically those luteinizing hormones, which is here in the green, are really spiked. 
along with her estrogen levels. So that's kind of telling that female, okay, go into heat. Days 5 to 16 here is the longest part of the heat cycle, and that's diestrous. So this is the point where, basically, if the egg gets fertilized, then the progesterone levels continue, the estrogen levels continue, and hopefully if she retains it, you'll have a baby in about five months. But if that egg does not get fertilized, this is where the prost prostaglandin or that luteinizing hormone starts to get produced. So if it doesn't get fertilized, there's no embryo, that starts to kick up and it tells the doe once she reaches proestrus, no fertilization occurs, then to go back into that heat cycle. So, all right, so quick look at the hormones and what they do. So the estrogen and again the progesterone that's produced in those um, ovaries, the estrogen induces estrus, so like I said, tells that dough to go into heat, and it grows those follicles that are producing the eggs. The progesterone stimulates and maintains what's called the corpus luteum, which we'll look at here in just a minute. It's a part of that follicle. The luteinizing hormone, it's kind of the mat final maturation of that follicle, um, kind of controls the ovulation and the formation of the corpus luteums, so the little nodes that you see on the follicles. The prostaglandin stimulates the release of the luteinizing hormone, which means there's no pregnancy. And then we have our follicle stimulating hormone, stimulates follicle population and maturation of those follicles. So, yes? You go back one slide. So within that 21 day period mm -hmm. that we're looking at, mm -hmm. So, yes, so optimal times to inseminate. When are those during that 21-day, basically, heat cycle on a, on a goat doe? Um, so right about when those, I've got to think, yeah, right when those estrogen, follicle-stimulating hormone levels um, are kind of increased. So right here, about day 18, 19, that's usually when she'll be in the actual standing heat. Um, so up to this point, those hormones are kind of getting geared up, and right about day 18, 19 is typically when they'll be in that standing heat. Um, so about then is when you're going to want to try to catch them. So, and there's usually about anywhere from a 12 to 50 hour window to get it done. Um, it's a particular doe that we AI'd here a couple weeks ago. Um, we happened to have a buck in the pen next to her breeding some friends of ours goats. Um, so we knew she was in Santa Heat because she was right there at the gate all day, butt presented to him, ready to go. So we waited until that evening. So she, we knew she'd been in the standing heat for 12 solid hours at least. So we knew that she was getting towards the end of it. So there's a better chance of that semen getting and staying where it should be. So out of those 21 days, you've got about an 18 hour window. Yeah. Yep, correct. Yep, so it's, it's definitely an art. <laughs> so back to the follicles. So these are all the follicles as we look at it during that estrus cycle. So from those ovaries, you can kind of see this is kind of the heat cycle. Um, so you've got the, these are the corpus luteum. So the lumps that you see here, different sizes, those are the corpus luteums that we talked about. So these are where those eggs are located. So they look kind of weird, but as the eggs get produced, those corpus luteums get produced, they grow. And so basically at this point, um, so we're looking at about day 12 to 14, if those eggs didn't get fertilized back in the oviduct, then it's going to tell the follicles to go ahead and start keep producing more eggs. So these corpus luteums, go ahead and kind of, if they aren't fertilized, or if the female does get fertilized, let me get it straight in my brain. If the female does get fertilized, starts producing, basically growing those kids, growing those lambs, then it tells 
the follicles to quit producing eggs. So at that point, this is an example of it. So it gets kind of pretty big, pretty nasty looking. This is kind of the inside of it. It then gets reabsorbed back into that ovary, back into those follicles as kind of these little nodes, and it gets just reabsorbed. Doesn't have a problem. But if she doesn't get fertilized, it will go ahead and basically, as you can say, almost explode. So that's kind of what we see here, and release the next set of eggs. So that's kind of an internal working of the follicles. <coughs> All right. So this is looking at day length, cycle length, things like that. So characteristics of the goat ester cycle. So actually, I misspoke. You want to catch them within the first couple of days of their cycle. So yeah. So looking at the goats, average cycle length is about 21 days, so about three weeks, but can be as short as 17 or as long as 24 days. The actual duration of that estrus, so that beginning part of that cycle, um, is going to be about 30 day or 30 hours on a doe, but can be as short as 16 or as long as 50. Um, so ovulation is just shortly after that estrus cycle. For sheep, we're looking at only 17 days for that heat cycle. So a lot shorter time span, but it also lets you know a lot quicker if you got her bred or not. And then duration of the estrus, again, about 30 hours, 16 to 15 is the range. So we have kind of five key factors to successful artificial insemination. Um, so technical experience, I'm not going to worry about playing the video, but like we said, technical experience is how good you are at it. Have you gone through training? Have you just watched YouTube videos? Or are you just going into it blind? Obviously, having that training behind you, you're going to have a lot higher rate of success and know what you're doing, where you're getting it to. Seasonality, so you're actually in the actual breeding season for that animal. So are you looking at the fall? Or have you had to basically induce her um, by presenting hormones kind of out of season? The age of the animal. So when you're looking at if it's a first breeding female, you might have a little bit harder time getting the AI done um, just because she hasn't had kids before. So it's going to be a lot harder to get through that cervix and things like that than it would be if she has kitted in the past. And then once you get into more aged animals, obviously the older they are, the harder it's going to get them bred anyways. Nutritional management, so obviously you want a healthy animal, you want a healthy female, both on the buck and the female side. On the females, you want a body condition score of about three or so, um, so that way they have good covering, they're not too fat which talking to some of our local vets, that's what they've seen issues with the last several years, especially on the boar goat side, is those does getting too fat um, and not being able to either breed or being able to kid properly. They've seen a great uptick in having to do C-sections because they just can't get them out through their hips because they're too fat. And then finally, that semen quality, like we talked about, having that good report, having the good motility and mobility to go with it is important, especially when you're working with frozen semen. So we have kind of four types of artificial insemination we're going to talk about. The first is this vaginal artificial insemination. So it's just like it sounds. So it's the simplest form of insemination. It's the natural form. So you deposit that fresh semen into the anterior vagina, so right basically as you get in through the vulva, without any attempt to locate the cervix. So you're just getting it right in there, like any male would, and depositing it there and hoping that sperm is motile enough and morphologically correct to get through everything else and get to the oviducts. So reported success rates are highly variable. Obviously, you've got a, probably even a shorter window doing it this way. And this method is not suitable to use with frozen semen because it's got, kind of gone through that kind of shock period where it's frozen at such cold temperatures that it just doesn't do as well just doing, depositing it straight into the vagina. You want to get much deeper when you're looking at that semen. Next type is called cervical artificial insemination. 
So this is another, what they refer to as cheap and relatively easy method of insemination. So this is where you locate that cervix. So that pink area behind the um, yeah, vagina, that, all that dense tissue, so you locate that. Um, so when you're looking at small ruminants, you're going to go in with a speculum. So it's basically a small plastic tube that you go in that you can look through. Obviously, not quite the same as cattle. Cattle, you can just kind of feel your way through and find it that way. With sheep and goats, you actually have to look for it. Um, so usually you have a light source on it, so you can actually see in there because it's dark otherwise. And the semen's deposited into kind of that first fold of that cervix. So you just get to the cervix and you just kind of deposit it right there so you can kind of help direct it a little farther. But you're not getting any further into that female. Um, so conception rates are better with this method because obviously you're getting it that much closer to those oviducts to where that fertilization actually occurs. Um, so fresh or chilled semen are best, but it's still kind of low with that frozen or chilled or frozen and then thawed semen. So this is where you're getting into kind of some more of the more specific um, equipment. So some equipment you'll need, especially if you're work, starting to work with frozen semen, is a liquid nitrogen tank and having somebody close by that can refill that liquid nitrogen tank every so often so it doesn't run dry and you don't have thawed, free, thawed semen. So speculums, like I said, they're kind of the tubes down here, so small or large depending on how large of an opening you're working with. An AI light, so it's just a little pinpoint light. You can see here it's kind of the, the rod and then a flexible end to it. So you can just put it in there, see what's going on. Straw tweezers, so that's getting your semen straws out of the tank instead of using your finger on that really cold stuff. Sterile lube. So when you insert anything into that female, you want to make sure it's lubed up so you're not going to cause any um, issues, abrasion, things like that. You want to make sure it's sterile because there are some that can interact with that sperm and cause issues. The insemination gun, I don't actually have a picture of it here, but it's just a small metal tube, kind of a plunger at the end. A breeding stand, any sort of stand or any way you can hold the female will work just fine. A thaw box, it's kind of hidden back here, but basically a thermos or something along those lines where you can get that temperature of that water to about that 95 to 98 degree and keep it there so it keeps that semen good until you're ready to use it. Paper towels, it can get messy, can get gooey. Um, the dough we AI'd here a couple weeks ago, let's put the speculum in and she just started leaking goo right out. So we knew she was good to go, but there was a little pile by the time we got done. And then a straw cutter, it's kind of this down here, it looks kind of like a mouth tuner almost. Um, so that'll cut the end of the straw so you can get the semen out because they are actually glass straws. And then a thermometer just so you can keep track, make sure that water stays warm like it should. So Kidding rates in relation to depth of cervical insemination. So we're looking at basically up to one centimeter. So this is basically the vaginal AI. You're looking at about 42% success with fresh semen or 27% with frozen. Not the best rates. If you're looking at one to three centimeters, so this is getting into that um, kind of closer to the cervical. You're looking at about 58%, so a little over half, and 46% with frozen, so just under half. So those are, depending on what you want to do, could be acceptable levels, but I'd rather have something closer to this, where you actually get it into that uterus. So you get past the cervix and into the uterus with that semen. You're looking at almost 70% success rate with fresh or frozen semen that way. So our next type is going to be the transcervical artificial insemination. So this is the one where you could probably go and get trained. Um, there are a bunch of different companies around the U.S. that do trainings every year. The company that I worked with here going on two years ago was B&D Genetics out of Cherry Valley, Arkansas. Um, they're great to work with. They have workshops 
all over all the time. Um, I know Capergia is another company, semen company, um, that does quite a few. Um, can't think of any others right off the top of my head. But, so those are all options. So with this method, you stick the speculum in, you find that cervix um, with the light, obviously, and use the insemination gun and insert it past that cervix. So get it actually into the uterus itself. So you're getting it all the way through that cervix, that rough material, and depositing the semen there. Like we saw on the last chart, obviously conception rates are higher because once you deposit the sperm that far, it really doesn't have as far to go, forward motility wise, to get to those oviducts. It just has to get through the entire rest of the uterus, the uterine horn, and it's right there at the oviduct instead of going through the vagina, the cervix, the uterus, uterine horn. So you're taking out about two steps by doing it this way. And then the last type is the laparoscopic, or they also refer to this as intrauterine. Um, so basically bypasses everything going through the animal and deposits semen directly into the uterine horns. So this is a surgical um, procedure. It's developed by Australian researchers, especially for all the sheep farms they have over there, for them to maintain the number of bucks or rams that they would need to cover those ewes. There'd be a lot of rams on those farms. So they started doing AIing on a lot of those ewes to help increase conception rates and decrease the amount of rams they had to use. Uh, minor procedure, kind of need that vet expertise. Um, so basically it uses an endoscope, an endoscope and a special lighted telescope to get in there, find the uterine horns, and deposit that semen. Can take as little as two minutes, usually not more than five if you know what you're doing. And usually you get about 50 to 80 percent conception rates. Let's see if we can, do you know if this is connected to the internet, Steve? Okay, we'll try it here. Let's see. Yep. It's like it looks like it's transferring, so yep. yeah. Cool. All right. Here is a video from Hoofstock Genetics showing laparoscopic AI. Here we see where they are inserting a couple of metal tubes so they can see internally. This portion shows where they are inserting the tube for the camera so they can see inside to the uterus and uterine horn. This is the second tube that will be where the insemination gun will come through to inseminate the horns. So on this video here you can see this whole body back here is the uterus and those curled things, those are the uterine horns. This is the insemination gun. And you can see as they insert it into the first uterine horn to inject the first round of semen. They are now inserting it into the second uterine horn for a second round of semen. This just helps to ensure the success of the artificial insemination. All right, so it just kind of gives you an idea of how the laparoscopic procedure done. Technically, that was done on a deer, but it's done the same on all small ruminants. So, All right, so just looking again at where our different artificial insemination locations occur, 
depend on what kind you're doing. So like we said, the natural or the vaginal artificial insemination is all the way towards the exterior. <coughs> Our cervical is getting here, depositing it right at the cervix itself. The transcervical is getting through that cervix into the uterus. And then the laparoscopic or the intrauterine is going directly into those uterine horns. So you can see, like we said, from that chart, the farther in you get that semen deposited, the higher your success rate is going to be for your kidding or your lambing season. Looking at the fresh versus frozen semen, um, optimal time for dissemination with non-frozen. So basically you've collected your male, you're going directly to the female. It's going to be about 12 to 18 hours after the onset of estrus, so after day zero. Um, dissemination should be done within about two days or a little longer after a cedar is removed, which is basically a hormone implant that's put into that female to help basically bring her into estrus. Um, so you're looking at 48 to 60 hours for intrauterine insemination. If you're using frozen thawed semen, yes? How long are you using the cedar in? Um, depends on who you talk to. So if you're using it kind of in season, to sink your dose so you can get them all done kind of at the same time if you have some huge event coming up. Um, you can do as short as 11 days, um, but most of the people I've talked to or looked at, is looking at are looking at 14 to 16 days typically. And out of season you would say 14 to 16? Yeah, even yep. um, go towards that 16 if not a couple days longer if you're doing out of season breeding. Yeah, yes, yep. So we're looking at when should, how long should cedars be left in that female? So in season, you could do it as short as 11 days. I like to leave it kind of closer to the 14 days, just so I, it's two weeks is an easier number to remember than 11 days. And are so. you giving any shots with that or just? Yep, so normally with the cedar implants in terms of shots to be given, um, there are a couple different procedures that people follow. You could use PG600 or um, Lutalase or a combination of those two. Um, depends on how much money you want to spend. Um, the PG600 can get a little expensive. Um, we had bought in a bottle for some dose that we provided for the AI clinic. Didn't know we could actually freeze it afterwards. So two thirds of the bottle went to waste because once you get it open and get it used, you need to get it used up quickly. Luckily, a friend of ours is a big pig farmer, so they always have it on stock. So if we need it, we could use it there. Um, but if you just go on and Google goat AI or sheep AI, hormones.edu or .gov or whatever, so you get a reputable source, there are different types that you could use. So. Everybody disagrees, though, on what they're yeah. doing, so I'm just curious. What yep, they yep. I, I kind of like that 14-day rule of thumb, typically. So. All right, and then looking at kind of our fresh versus frozen semen, looking at that pregnancy rate. So if you're looking at frozen and then thawed semen, the orange is going to be no cervical penetration. So you're looking at only about 15% success. So that's just doing the um, vaginal or just barely that cervical artificial insemination. So you're not looking at very good success with frozen thawed if you don't get it in to that cervix or past that cervix. Once you do that, it increases to about 60% success. When you're looking at fresh semen, so it has not been thawed or frozen yet, um, no cervical penetration, so more of the natural or the vaginal, you're looking at about 40% success. When you actually get it past the cervix, you're looking at about 75% success. So like, yes? I would say it'd be pretty close to the fresh semen. Um, with, the, with the natural mating, you'd probably have a little bit higher success rate because obviously he has a little better chance of knowing when she's actually in heat. He's in with her basically 24-7. Um, so there's a better chance because he can hit her so many times over a course of so many hours. So there's a better chance with the natural cycle than with the AI, but the fresh is obviously has a little bit more success. So, all right, and then real quick, um, just some record keeping things to remember. Um, 
So when you do artificial insemination, these are some good things to keep track of. Records are always good anyways, um, but artificial inseminations, you have, obviously have the date, so you have an idea of when you're going to have babies. What semen it was you used, so if you're actually registering the animal, you have all that information. Um, so post-thaw examination, if you examined it, kind of what did you see? Um, how far did you go in? Did you go to the transcervical level? Did you just do the vaginal? Did you get to the cervical? Um, and then any other things you want to keep note of. And then just breeding records in general. Um, we just started keeping closer tabs on our breeding records in the last about four years. Um, so these are all things that we keep track of, especially birth weight, birth weight for us. Um, with having the number of bucks that we did, um, knowing which ones usually gave on average a lower birth weight helped us when we put them in for our first freshening does. So those does that hadn't been bred before, so it's a little bit easier on them in theory. Granted, you always have those outliers where you'll have 10 or 11 pound kids, no matter which animal you're going to have. But on average, we've gotten a pretty good idea over the last few years which of those bucks is going to throw a little bit smaller kids. So we'll always put, if we can, if it's not related to them, the young does in with them. So it might hopefully be a little bit easier birthing on them. So. With that, do we have any questions at all? I have lots of questions. Okay, Mike. <laughs> so you gave me this kit here, this nitrogen tank, speculum, AI light, stock, all that good stuff. How much is that? Yep. So an average artificial insemination kit, um, there's several websites you can get it from, but you're gonna look at about hundred and eighty to two hundred and fifty dollars for everything but the liquid nitrogen tank. Um, semen tanks can cost anywhere from, if you get a good viable used one, you could get them as cheap as 250 bucks, but you wanna make sure it's gonna hold that liquid nitrogen um, all the way up to 1200 bucks, depending on what size you want and things like that. Um, luckily for us, we have a semen dealer two miles down the road from us, so we had emergency where semen we got this fall. Um, thought we had a good viable tank from a friend of ours that we traded for some other stuff. Ended up that it did not hold liquid nitrogen. We put it in one night and the next morning we checked and there was nothing left. Um, so luckily he had a good used one uh, available for us that we were able to pick up that night when we were getting the semen. Um, so you want to make sure it's a good tank. Um, a lot of times they might store those tanks for you just so Obviously, there's going to be a, a storage fee, but so that way they've got, got it there and got it covered. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> All right, Mike. <laughs> so at the bottom of one of your pages was a reference for Salomon artificial insemination sheep and goats by Evans and Maxwell. Yes. Um, I looked online. That's a book from 1987, and it runs about 800 bucks used on Amazon. Yeah. Is there any newer research <laughs> that's been done on AI and sheep and goats? I mean, there has to be a better resource or a newer resource, I would say. Yep. So the one reference that was made, the AI of Sheep and Goats by Evans and Maxwell, fairly expensive book. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of research out, out there. Um, so if you just 
hate to say it, but if you just Google. Yeah, I don't Google stuff. Yep. I, I yep. With a PhD in yeah. Biology, yeah. So yep. 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 So, <laughs> so if, if you research, we'll put it that way, if you yeah. research okay. sheep and go AI online and use that .edu at the end of it, you'll get updated university information. Should be without much problem. But yeah, there's been some updated, but that's kind of the, the cornerstone, kind of the originals that were doing it back in the 80s. So. Mike, a good resource to check out would be extension.org. Yeah, yep. And extension, E-X-T-E-N-S-I-O-N dot org, uh -huh. which is a site that the land grants across the country all put information into. So mm -hmm. it okay. will be the research-based stuff you're looking for. Yep, so that website was E-X-T-E-N-S-I-O-N dot org. Yes. And that'll give you all extension information from how to sew a button on to artificial insemination. So, yes? Eliminating the cost of the human is a tiny variable. One, how do you find it in that? And two, what would be adding the other cost? The feeder, the hormones, a vet to do it because sheep pretty much have to be done by themselves. Yep. All right, so looking at kind of the overall cost of artificial insemination. Um, so looking at your cost of semen overall, um, you can get it anywhere from, well, we've traded a couple packs of brats for ours, but um, anywhere from 10 bucks up to $250 would kind of be, but average semen will probably looking at 25 to $50 is kind of the average that I've seen. Um, where you can get the semen, um, like I said, there's several companies out there. Um, right offhand, Capra Gia, C-A-P-R-A, capital G-I-A, um, is one fairly large small ruminant company. Um, that B&D Genetics, uh, Cherry Valley, Arkansas is another one. Um, there's several others that aren't coming right to mind right now. Um, but again, if you research <laughs> sheep and goat semen, uh, frozen semen, you should be able to find a few companies. But I know Capergia is probably the number one dairy goat semen holder in the U.S. right now. So if you're looking at dairy goats, they would be who I'd go to to start with. So, And then looking at the overall cost of AI, um, a bag of cedars, which I think contains 20 cedars maybe. Um, i trying to remember how much that was. I think it was about a dollar a cedar maybe. So about $20 for that pack, I think. I'd have to look it up again. Um, when you're looking at the PG-600 and the Lutalase, obviously the size of the bottle is going to make a little bit of a difference, but um, that PG-600 was, I think, close to $90 a bottle. So that was the most expensive part of it for when we did it for the workshop. Um, Lutalase, a little less expensive. Um, I don't remember what it was the last time we got it. But when you're looking at the overall dosage, the cost of the semen, the cost of the equipment, um, if you're looking at just doing one animal alone, that's all you're doing, um, you're going to look at probably about $300 for that animal. But when you spread it out over 10, 15, 20 animals, it starts to get pretty reasonable at that point. You're looking at maybe um, 10 to 15, 10 to, well, you've got the cost of the semen in there, so 50 to $75 an animal on average. But once you get that AI equipment basically paid off, it gets a lot cheaper at that point. So, but that's using all the hormones and things like that too. All right, uh, we've gone over a little bit, but that's okay. Yep. We're in a break uh, period anyhow. So thank you, Alicia. And uh, we'll be back here at 